Yeah, I think there's like a common misconception that people think like more is better, but really like better is better. And like, you know, caring about something and like putting in the attention to detail and the energy to like really truly involve yourself in something is it's, I think that has more value than they're just being like bigger metrics. Oh, there's more Instagram followers. It doesn't, or there's, you know, more engagement on YouTube or, you know, the audience is bigger. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that those bigger numbers either, you know, a validated or B like change the quality of it. I think like, you know, the quality is decided by like, you know, the more core audience and like the person putting in the work to make something you know, happen that they, you know, if they're lucky enough to share it with people. Hey, what's up, everyone? This episode, we're talking to Steve Crandall of Drop In Coffee, Rad Share, and FBM Bike Company. Uh, I've known Steve for at least probably 20 years, um, actually longer than that. Met him back, I think, in 1993 at a bike contest in uh, somewhere in upstate New York. We, we talk about that a bit. Uh, he was on his first run of FBM shirts, and I was on my first and final run of 4130 shirts. We traded shirts, and I never made another run of those shirts. And he went on to uh, do FBM Bike Company, which is one of the most influential uh, BMX brands in you know the last 20, 25 years or so. And uh, the rest is history there. We get into a lot of stuff here. Uh, what he's been doing since the filming of Don't Stand in Line and um, what his future plans are. So check it out. I think you guys will enjoy it. Yo, how's it going? How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good, man. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you sound you sound pretty good. I always sound good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I was trying to just look up your number. And I don't know, they change. I, my, I hate when my phone updates. Every time it updates, it does something weird and i wasn't used to looking and just try i was just trying to find your phone number and it like all of a sudden i was calling you and then i was facetiming you well you gotta get your shit together yeah it's that's a mess over here <laughs> how's it going there good man sun's out sun's out sunny, not... sunny warm day nice over here over here at rad share and drop in headquarters hanging out <laughs> uh what was going on? Was Stu in town? Is Stu t still in town? Yeah, Stu was driving from Austin to Philly on the on his way. He stopped through here to uh, start filming for the next ESPN X Games TV show. Oh, cool. all right. What? Well, cool, cool. I was gonna say. Yeah, I that real know if you were. real street TV show. Or yeah, whatever the hell that is. I thought you might be working on your next real street part. Yeah, I, I was, but I had to get my mags fixed. Ah, nice. Are those are you, are you rocking tough twos these days or paragrounds? Uh, tough threes. Tough threes. <laughs> yeah, I'm on the cutting edge. That is pretty good, man. In all seriousness, are we, are we are we podcasting right now or are we just bullshitting? I mean, we're doing. I mean, it's kind of all the same thing, isn't it? For anyone who might not know who you are, why don't you just just briefly introduce yourself and, and let us, you know, name and and what it is that you do. Uh, my name's Steve Crandall, and I have been voted internationally as the most handsome man in BMX. Um, spent the previous 27 years doing FBM Bike Company and currently working for a nonprofit that I uh, co-founded with Nate Hanger called RadShare. And uh, it's sister company, which helps fund the nonprofit, called Drop-In Coffee. That's and, awesome. Uh, aside from, yeah, aside from that, I'm just a regular dude that likes riding bikes and having fun. Cool. Um so obviously the BMX thing has been huge in your life. How did you start? Well, maybe that's a good place to start. How did you get into BMX to begin with? Um, when I was real young, there was, uh, I don't know how I got into it, but I got a BMX bike when I was real young, just like a department store brand. And, uh, I lived in military housing on Long Island, New York. And, uh, it's kind of like projects. So I just ended up like, trading baseball cards for parts with like neighborhood kids and whatnot and kind of got into BMX that way in the early eighties. Okay. And then, uh, I started racing in 86 and from then it's been a pretty steady, like lifestyle commitment. Right. Someone was asking me recently how I got into it. And I honestly, I kind of had the same 
reaction as you. I don't really remember what put it on my radar other than knowing that I like to ride my bike and do jumps on it. But at that point, I, I literally had, just had like a, I had a Schwinn Stingray. I didn't yeah. really know about BMX, but I somehow knew it was a thing. And I realized that recently that I think what put it on my radar is sounds real stereotypical and uh, like a tip, uh, sounds like a typical answer. It was ET. And I oh yeah. I think I saw it, but I didn't really process it because I was so young. And yeah. then I just kind of had this idea that it was out there. And I remember thinking there must be magazines or something. I remember getting like getting a book and that, you know, the scholastic book fair thing they would do. I remember getting this like mm-hmm. this BMX book. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if that was any even relevant to what we're talking about. But <laughs> I just, <laughs> but yeah, I uh, definitely like had bikes like growing up, and then some of the neighborhood kids had some like Schwinn Stingrays that were like they put knobby tires on and whatnot. Yeah, but then I like kind of discovered these like Hesher kids that would build like kicker ramps in these drainage ditches by where I lived, and uh, I would just kind of like watch them, and then when they weren't around, I would try it too, and then that was pretty much the start of it. Yeah, it was it's just a yeah, I, I remember it just being this weird real organic thing that just happened that just all of a sudden I was doing and had no idea really why or how. It sounds yeah. like you had a similar thing. Yeah, there wasn't really an outlet for like there was magazines, but when you're like 8 and 10 years old, you don't you don't find magazines like <laughs> not, not those kind about of magazines. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, so it's like so it's a, it's a currently different, you know, it was a totally different world back then. And like, you know, you know, nowadays there's all kinds of access points, whether it's like public skate parks or, you know, watching videos on the internet. But back then it was just kind of like, if you lived in a neighborhood with some burnout kids on some BMX bikes, you're like, Oh cool. Check that out. Sounds like music's been a, played a pretty big role in everything you've done. I think, yeah. Like, so by the time I'd like reach like, you know, preteen adolescence, we, we, my family moved to Ithaca, New York. And, um, you know, that was late eighties and the punk scene and the skateboard scene and the BMX scene were all kind of like interconnected. Cause there was only like, you know, maybe two dozen people all together that were in, into that at all. So there was like okay. four or five BMXers and like a dozen skateboarders and like a dozen punks with like a little overlap and all that. But like back then, like even like those subcultures, like they were very loose in their boundaries. So like hardcore was all connected to punk and like, you know, punk was connected to skateboarding and skateboarding was connected to bikes. So it was just kind of like everyone was sort of like that wasn't like into mainstream sports or mainstream activities like team sports and whatnot. Like everyone kind of like, you know, existed within the same realm. Right. And do you see any, any connection or relationship between punk and hardcore and BMX and skateboarding and, and what you've made your life other than the fact that it's revolves around those types of things as far as uh, just building a business? Well, I think like the, like the, the common bond between them all is like the DIY ethos. And it was like, it was just because it became an understanding that if you wanted to have something happen, you had to do it yourself, whether it was build a ramp or start a band or, you know, put on a show or whatever it is. So I think all that kind of was interconnected and it just like, you know, kind of became like the DNA for what, for everything we were involved in. So if, if that answers that question. Yeah. Yeah. I know that makes sense. I had this thought earlier today about, I don't know. I, I know there's always, there's always, um, we can be real protective about different scenes and even crossing over from one to the other, the like skate versus BMX or punk and hardcore versus one or the other, even though that kind of runs through all of them. But I feel like, um, as a subculture, each, each different one can be very diff- very protective. And when, when things break out into the mainstream, um, well, yeah, it's like, like the people that kind of fostered all these communities kind of like whether they wanted to or realized it or not are like, you know, they don't want to just hand off the keys to just any passerbys. 
Hmm. So it's like, in my understanding and like kind of the way I've always felt is like, you know, if you're going to like participate, you need to like earn your, your keep. Yeah. So it's like, and I think that that's always been like an, kind of like an unsaid thing. It's like, you know, if you're going to be involved in any of these like subcultures and these communities, it's not like, you know, no free rides. Like everyone's got to bring something to the table or bring something to like, you know, whatever's happening. Right. You don't want any carpet baggers basically. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's like, you know, no giveaways. It's like, you got to earn it. Right. 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 You got to build your own fun. You know, you can't just show up to a spot that <laughs> someone just built. Yeah. You know, someone just put in all that hard work. They don't want, you know, it's just kind of squandered away on squares and, you know, people that don't appreciate like the culture of it all. No, I hear you. And I think something that bothers me about it, maybe you have a take on this, um, is I don't like when people get real excited about, and I don't want to name anything in particular, but some of the bigger mainstream things that are out there, or they're now taking to BMX or skateboarding. Um, I feel like pe- people are, are psyched on that because it's like it's as if it's being validated, and I don't think it ever really needed that validation as far no, as I, I you think know, music there's, too. There's like a com- yeah, I think there's like a common misconception that people think like more is better. Right. But really like better is better and like you know, caring about something and like putting in the attention to detail and the energy to like really truly involve yourself in something is it's I think that has more value than they're just being like bigger metrics, you know, like oh there's more Instagram followers. It doesn't or there's, you know, more engagement on YouTube or you know, the audience is bigger. Yep. It doesn't it doesn't mean that like those bigger numbers either, you know, A, validate it or B, like, change the quality of it. I think, like, you know, the quality is decided by, like, you know, the more core audience and, like, the person putting in the work to make something, you know, happen that they, you know, if they're lucky enough to share it with people. Right, right. It's, you're you're better to have, you know, a thousand. And I'm, I'm I'm not opposed to, like, building a bigger audience or sharing it with more people, like, whatever it is, you know, like, the thing. But it's, like, just because more people have eyes on it doesn't mean it's like, you know, more has valid. more credibility or right. yeah. It's just right. like, yeah. I mean like insane clown posse has a huge audience, but like <laughs> what they do, you know, does it doesn't mean that that's better than like, you know, say something that's like a little less, I don't, I don't even know. That might be just a ridiculous analogy, but you know what I mean? Like, no, no, I, I know, like Br- it. Britney Spears is like the most popular you know, pop singer in the nineties, but like, it just wasn't good music, you know? So. Right. I have <laughs> it's funny. I, I, it's off topic, but I have an insane clown posse story at some point. I, maybe I'll tell you, but no, that's, it's something that always, I admired about what you did with FBM is like, um, it was always core. It was for, it wasn't for mo- the mainstream for the most part. I mean, those, like it, and the it, ghetto, it was, never, it was never the the ghetto, like the ghetto street jams, for instance. I mean, those things looked. I don't think I ever made it to one, but they looked like so much fun. Well, those things. So we were never like anti, you know, mainstream or like popular opinion or anything like that. But just by nature, what we did was like a reaction to like what was mainstream at the time. So, like say say for example, the ghetto comp, we built ridiculous you know, skate parks out of basically garbage. Right. Like wood and materials pilfered from like abandoned buildings in upstate New York and, you know, pallets and dumpsters and everything. Whereas like that was a reaction to like the very sterile contest atmosphere of like the X games and, you know, the Mountain Dew tours and all that kind of stuff. So it was like, it was all kind of tongue in cheek, but what we did just because, you know, we're like, Oh, well let's just go the opposite direction of all that. Right. It just was, you know, by nature, it was punk, you know, just, but it wasn't like, it, there was no, like, it wasn't even intentional or even thought of. It was just like, oh, let's just, let's just do something that's totally different than what's happening. And, and that's was, just what, what it. Yeah, it was, it was relatable. I, I, I know, you know, sitting there and watching uh, some of those bigger contests, especially at that time, there was no chance I was going to get any, any time on ramps like that. And even if I did. Well, yeah. Yeah, so so so, so the obstacles you guys so what, had were relatable. 
So the first thing we did, we didn't even realize as we were doing it, was when we made, you know, stuff that you could ride out of stuff that you could get for free. Whereas, like, if you were trying to, like, put on an event and you needed to have, like, a ramp builder come in and put something in, like, the labor and materials would be, like, you'd have to have a network or an energy drink sponsor to make it happen. But what we did was say, hey, we don't have any money, but, you know, we have our community and we could work together to make you know, make something cool happen with, with what we do have. And that's how, how it happened. You know, it's like no different than like a house show in a basement or like, you know, a garage band or what have you. It's like, you don't need an arena to, to put on a concert. You don't need, you know, a crazy recording studio to like make a demo tape and you don't need, you know, a network to put on a cool contest series. You just need to be involved and work within your community and, you know, you know, don't be afraid to get your hands dirty. Exactly, exactly. Um, wow, this is probably my first natural segue. Speaking of energy drinks, what what <laughs> <laughs> what prompted you to to start dropping coffee? Oh, actually, back up. What, explain how. What was the transition from? Because when we filmed, uh, I think it was October 2019. You hadn't really. Um, you hadn't really pulled the trigger on, on ending FBM or at least FBM as a bike company. Uh, I think you were, yeah. that you were thinking about that and you hadn't started dropping coffee. So that all kind of happened after we filmed and, and we addressed so, it at the end, but what, explain how that all kind of came about, I guess. So that whole time period when you were filming, I knew that the FBM like business plan was kind of it was, it had run its course, but we still had things in motion that would, would require us to like kind of go through the motions like through January. And then in January, we kind of called it as far as regular business operations go for FBM. And uh, it still exists on, in some level as like an idea and the you other know, soft goods available. But, okay. um, that's a whole separate topic, but, uh, you know, during that whole period, I was really like burned out on the, like the for-profit business end of doing FBM. Like FBM as a community, as like, and as something that I did like as a bike rider and like as art projects, I was like still fully engaged with, but like the consumer and marketing aspect of FBM were like, had really burned me out. Like just trying to sell stuff just to like pay bills was like, yeah. It it's, also, it's a difficult thing. You, you know? guys also, I mean, you weren't just, you weren't just putting stickers on, on frames that came in from overseas. You were actually running a machine shop, right? Yeah. So, so we had started our own machine shop and we'd started our own distribution company. So it was like, uh, it was like a difficult business model for, for being in the BMX industry. Not a lot of money, you know, not a lot of margins for profit and anything that we were doing. So I'd gotten pretty burned out on just trying to like convince people to buy stuff from us just so that we could pay our, you know, our bills. And, um, I'd gotten more and more in tune with the ideas of trying to share. Hence the, the nonprofit rad share, which is like basically getting bikes and helmets and all the above for under-resourced kids and under-resourced community communities. And, um, in doing that, I just started exploring different ideas outside my like typical bike industry, you know, history. And, um, you know, I've been painting coffee cups as like part of like, whatever. I don't even know why, why I would paint coffee cups, but just became my thing, my gimmick, I guess. And, um, just kind of like started exploring the idea of developing a coffee brand that. I could do as a new project post FBM, but also as like a way to, you know, raise money to help operate the, the nonprofit, you know, basically help fund the nonprofit. Okay. And, and, and they, they both, they both exist in like the same headquarters and, uh, you know, the Nate hanger, Nate hanger, the other co-founder is like involved in both projects, like equally with myself. Oh, cool! I, I I knew he was involved in Radshare, but I wasn't sure about the yeah. coffee company. Yeah, so so they're kind of they're separate businesses, but parallel efforts. Right. So they they kind of complement each other. Yeah. 
And tell me more about RadShare. How did that come about? What sparked that idea? Um, well, I had done work over the years with like free bike repair and like giving away bikes and uh, also giving away books. Like I had worked with a, uh, it was a, ironically, it was a, it was a school bus that I would help out with. And it would, it was called the Mo Book Mo Bike Mobile. And we would go to like inner cities, like in Baltimore and Philly and like even as far as New Orleans and set up with community centers and do free bike repair and like give away bikes to kids and give away free books. Like with the idea being that like a bike and an education can be real empowering for people that otherwise might not have access to the same stuff. And uh, it's just something that always stuck with me. It was like a lot more, it just, it seemed to make a bigger and more immediate impact in local communities than like what I was doing in the BMX industry. Like all of, all of the above were like pretty fulfilling, but like, this like took on like a different meaning for me personally and like seeing, you know, young riders like exposed to like what a BMX bike can do for them and like how they see the world and what they feel like they, they can accomplish. Like was like, you know, that spoke to me. So it was like, just like, man, this is, this is cool. Like give kids bikes, you know, give them a chance to develop, their own understanding of the world in a positive way. No, that, yeah, that's so, awesome. It's got to make you feel and, good. Um, it's cool, man. Like it's a, it's a pretty modest effort in the big, you know, in the big picture, but it's like without having to worry about all the operating expense of something like FDM, which was like, there was a lot of overhead. Mm. It's like, if I can get one, one rider, whether it's a, you know, doesn't matter who they are, or where they're from. If I can get one rider, one person to become a BMXer, and I didn't say become a BMXer, but to, to learn about BMX or to be like affected by it in a positive way, then like I've done my job, you know, it's like, but we're sending, you know, bikes and helmets, you know, all over the place. Like we, Malali skate park in the Bronx, we, we've got a thing going with them where we send free helmets to the kids there, um, to the wheel mill in Pittsburgh. Nice. Um, there was like an adopted kid from Honduras that someone had reached out to, reached out to us about. And, uh, we gave him like, it was locally in Richmond here and we gave him a brand new bike and a brand new helmet. And, you know, he'd never, you know, had a brand new bike in his life. He was English second language and in, in pretty tough circumstances, but like that could potentially change that dude's life, you know? So it was like, it's just real rewarding and there's no pretense to it. You know, if I give away one helmet or, you know, fix one kid's bike, or give away one bicycle, like then it's just, it's just positive. You know, there's, yeah, there's, it's, it's, so it's just real cool. You know, it's like, and I've spent so much time, you know, with the for profit, for profit aspect of, you know, the BMX thing, you know, doing FDM, it just feels really cool to like not try to sell stuff to people and just try to like make efforts to share as much with as many people as possible. Right, right. I mean, not that you weren't doing FBM for the right reasons, but this is totally, I mean, there's, this is totally all in for and, and not taking yeah, it's, anything it's, out. It's you know? all, it's all in, it's all in good faith, you know, and it's right. like, but like, just like the energy that that, you know, that comes back to me, like how it reverbs back to me, it's like, that's got more value of it, value to me than like, you know, money it's just right. like gives me, it just gives me a good feeling. It gets me stoked and it, you know, inspires me to do more stuff creatively. Like, which is kind of how drop in, you know, kind of came to be, you know, it's like, I was just a, getting excited about stuff again. And like, you know, I'm sure you've heard it with some of the other guys in this project that don't stand in line project. It's like, it's real easy to like make it seem like everything's really rad but it's like hard to avoid burnout when you're like going against the grain yep. for your like whole life and every aspect of your life. So something like this, it's like, you know, people just want to support it, you know, because it's a cool project. But like when they realize that people, when, when people realize that they can, you know, help do something positive like this, you know, they get excited and like that energy kind of comes back, you know, it's like, they don't have to like buy into something. They're just like, Oh, this is cool. I can support this. Like I'm way down. Like, what, what can I do to help? Right. Right. And it's just, and, and like, that's like, 
that's going, you know, that's not going against the grain. It's creating a whole different grain and just like going with it. Yeah. No, I completely understand what you're saying. Um, but so speaking of drop in, um, so obviously coffee, a machine shop making bikes, not exactly the same thing. Do you, what similarities or differences or, you know, are you seeing between the two different industries in, in terms of just day to day operations or, or branding and marketing or, I mean, what's the biggest, what, what's been hardest to transition that, over to? Um, well, I just don't, I don't know anything about coffee except that I like it. So it <laughs> reminds me of when I started the bike company yeah. of like super naive, but real eager. And like, sometimes that like naive enthusiasm could be more valuable than just, you know, having all your ducks in a row. But, um, you don't know what you working. don't know. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, I'm all right. I'm not jaded on this yet. You know, it's like, not to say that I was jaded, but you know what I mean? I hear you. But, um, it's, it's, it's real similar in that it's like small batch, you know, good quality, like working within our community. It's like, I'm not outsourcing stuff from people that I don't know, or like lining the pockets of people that either, you know, don't know who I am or, or care what I'm doing. So it's like, a lot of those things kind of overlap. It's just a different, just a different way of doing business, I guess, you know, di- totally different product, but like the same kind of ideas, you know, a lot, a lot of art based and community based, you know, projects. So it's really not that much different. It's just maybe like, it feels like brand new because it's like, you know, it is. <laughs> right. Right. Totally. Um, I wanted to ask, do you remember the, when do you remember when we met like at that contest, do you remember where it the was? The Hudson Valley skate park in Newburgh, New York. Yes. <laughs> it was the first place me and my crew ever had a gun pulled on us. Tell me and about it that. Was the most, it was the most asbestos filled warehouse in the Hudson Valley. And it had that big bowl in it and all kinds of cool. So it was the first indoor skate park our crew had ever been to okay I, it was one of the first i'd been to on my bike i think i had been able to go into some on a skateboard yeah it was the closest one that we knew about at the time that was like 1992 or 93 if i'm not mistaken and there was like some kind of like contest or event or what have you there and your bike broke and i helped you fix it and you wouldn't have won and gone on to fame and fortune without my help <laughs> Yeah, it was yeah, kind of yeah. like that movie Rad. You know, I was like, if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't have amounted to shit. Yeah, you were my pit crew. Yeah, that was yeah, <laughs> no, that was yeah. I remember because I went out with a bunch of my friends, but none of them actually rode. They just they skated. So I was there kind of by myself as far as you know, riding goes, and I was blown away by just seeing. Um, I think, I think Lucky was there and Joe Rich were there. Was there? Yeah. And I, if I remember correctly, well, as my photo album tells me, Jim Delaval, Chris Hallman, Robbie Morales, Joe Rich, Lucky, and Jeff Allen from Connecticut were all there riding. And uh, yeah, it was quite a. They, they wow. had all they had all ridden ramps before, and they were killing it. And like they were so good that we just assumed that they were like grown ups, but they were the same age as, as we are. Yeah, and I was like mind blown that like these dudes just. Yeah, we were such like hokey backwoods kids from like small town upstate New York, and these dudes looked like pro bike rider stuff. It was mind blowing. Yeah, and I and I remember I had seen Joe Rich maybe one or two other times, and, and Lucky too. I think I went down to Posh for something. I, I have footage of this somewhere, but you know, at that time he was you know he was wearing a, a full face helmet too. So just anyone wearing a full face, I think, impressed me. Yeah, I mean, those dudes might as well have been evil can evil to me. Like, <laughs> I'm glad it wasn't just it me. Was, no, I remember like very distinctly because like soon after that we we we'd gone to like a Hoffman contest at the Shimersville skate park, yes, and then went then went and rode. Um, and we did that with uh, the South Shore crew, like mall bike shop yep. crew, like the Degertos and who I barely you know, knew at the time. Yeah, Tony Long and all those guys. And then we also went to Magic Skate Park in Reading that same trip. But, like, that was, like, 
so Newburgh and then Chimersville and then Reading were like the first three skate parks we went to. And that's kind of like those are good ones. how we met the, the New England riders, you know. And then we started going up and going to jams at like Natick, uh, the pig pen trails in Natick. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, that was like the beginning of the world opening up to us. It was like a bunch of different like little scenes started connecting, you know, like, and then we started meeting people and like, you know, trading zines, you know, trading stickers and like that kind of like was the catalyst for, you know, what became the rest of our lives and our crew, you know, we were like, you know, at first we'd opened up a magazine when we were like in middle school, but this was like opening up the world. We just kind of like, well, like, there's a bunch of different scenes of, you know, riders just like the, us in like, you know, any town USA, like imagine what's out there in the world. And then it just was like, from then on, it was like, it's on. Right. Let's go check out every spot and meet every person we can. Cause every time we did that, it was just like putting more fuel in the gas tank. Yeah. Just open it up bigger. I just remember Yeah. W- when I met you, we traded t-shirts and it's, it, and it, it kills me cause I think about it sometimes and I don't know how long you've been doing it, but I feel like that was one of the very first designs. I that got was probably, that was probably the first batch of shirts we like, and right. printed and traveled with. That's what I thought. I just in my mind, I thought that was probably the case. And so, and and same with what I had. The, the difference is that was probably also my last batch of shirts. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and and what amazes me is that well, it doesn't amaze me because I having known you a bit, but what kills me is that I mean, not that I would have been able to do what you did, but. The point being that you kept going with it. You took the ball and ran and made it happen. Whereas I just kind of was like, just, well, I think just because like, <laughs> cause like you, what you were doing might've been like a little bit more, you know, solo style. It and was, what I was doing sure. was like, I was like sort of like the, the figurehead of FDM, so to speak, but it was a crew, you know, like, so it was, it was almost like, you know, we, we, we built momentum as like a group, you know, each one of us kind of like had our strengths and we all supported each other and what we were trying to do, but it was all going along like congruently. So it kind of like, it was easier to keep momentum, you know, like as, yeah. like, as a collective. So I was pretty lucky in that regard, you know, like I was the one that like, you know, did FBM specifically as my project, but we did it as a crew, you know, like yeah. me, Mike Tag and Magilla and like, you know, Sue Johnson and Crazy Joe, like the original, like, crew that, you know, it wasn't like we were a team or any, like, anything like that. It was just, like, the dudes. Right. And FDM kind of, like, was spawned out of that, like, group thing. It was organic, you know. Yeah, it was. There was no, like, you know, we didn't go to, none of us went to college or even community college or anything. It was just, like, it was just cause and effect and, like, you know, more it was just like trying to like a means to an end and trying to make ends meet. It was, you know, it was all, it was all connected, you know, like how do we get to that DS contest in Oklahoma? Yeah. Well, between the, between the five of us, we got $80. That's enough for gas. And if we print like, you know, 12 t-shirts, you know, that'll give us an extra hundred bucks, you know, blah, blah, blah. So it was just like that kind of thing. It was just like, it's, it's just all trying to connect the dots. It was never like, ooh, let's make this stuff and sell it and turn a profit. Right, right. I mean, it's real similar to being in a band. You're just going out there and trying to sp- spread. Yeah, the- you're just trying to fill the fill the gas tank in the van to, to get you to the next spot. And once you get there, you worry about getting to the next one after that. Right, 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 right. So I, I got to ask, because when I contacted you, I mean, we've had random run-ins over the years, but we never really spent a ton of time together i mean we've been in contact and stuff but when i asked you to do this project i'm curious as to what you were thinking because I, I really well by the time i got to film with you you, you were the last one so i had a, a, a more solid idea of where it was going but i think i filmed with greg first and that first day i really I had an outline of what I wanted to what I wanted it to be, but it definitely changed, and I didn't have a cl- real clear picture. So I'm wondering what you were thinking. Well, one of the things is like I've done a lot of like 
media and publicity stuff with FDM. So I was like totally aware of not trying to sound like a broken record talking about our history. But I was also starting to see the writing on the wall that like the FDM project was like going to be unsustainable. So I was like, I was like, fuck man, I don't want to like put a bunch of time and energy into something like based on, you know, what FDM's supposed to be if it's like not going to keep going. Right. So I was like, I was super tentative, but then I was like, as you kind of explained to me, like that it wasn't specifically just about like, you know, a biopic on FDM. It was more just like, you know, like a subculture sort of like DIY concept of like doing your own thing. I was like, all right, cool. Like, yeah, but you know, it's like, you know, it's weird. Cause like, you know, pretty, you know, I'm, I'm fine. Like talking to people and getting in front of the camera, but at the same time, I'm like, I'm a little reserved about wanting to put myself out there too much without having something important to say. No, I hear you. So, so I just, you know, but, uh, what, so what did you? I'm just so I'm just so goddamn scatterbrained. When you like when you first reached out, I was probably like, uh, <laughs> you know, like no, you were pretty. I had cool. to go drink. You were well. You replied pretty quickly. So, because I, I got to admit, I've had so I had this idea for so long, and then it, I was just sitting down in the morning drinking my coffee one day, and I was just not looking forward just to, to going and uh, editing wedding videos or whatever the hell I had on my plate that day. And I just said, you know what? I'm just going to email. I'm just going to pick these four guys that that I, I have a little bit of a relationship. Not super close, but well enough to that I feel like I could reach out to them and put this idea in front of them and see what they say. And once it's out there, if they agree, then I'm locked in and I got to do something and stop complaining about you know what, what I'm doing and do something cool. And, and you guys yeah. all responded fairly quickly i mean i think within an hour or two um yeah i'm pretty much always down for whatever if someone's got like if someone wants to take the time to talk to me about something then i try to be like as respectful and serious about it as i can and if there's any actual follow-up that'll kind of like decide whether or not you know so-and-so was like you know has their shit together enough to make something cool happen then you know obviously you did and like this project is you know, had far exceeded my expectations of what it was going to be because, you know, some people are just crazy. They have great intentions, but they have, like, no idea on how to, like, Make turn an idea into reality. Right. So I was, like, super, super stoked, for one, you know, to be included with such heavyweights, you know, as, as the rest of the guys, and then to, like, learn more about them, but also to, like, you know, witness the attention to detail and, like, in, you know, your your craft being honed in so well and, like, you know, thank you. You did a great job edit, editing out all of my like nonsense, so I didn't <laughs> sound entirely ridiculous. So that was cool too, you know. No, yeah, I mean, you guys all have really good stuff to say. Um, did you have? Did it? Does anything stick out as far as what anyone else, what what, what the other guys had to say or their thoughts on things? I mean, I feel I like just, it was just like it was. It was just really cool to see like the similarities as well as the contrast with each person, you know? So it wasn't like, it wasn't like we were all like buddies that like, you know, had like a high school reunion and wanted to tell the same story. Like, although like each of us has like, you know, a similar take on things, it's all completely unique from each other. And like, to me, it just, I don't know, it got me psyched because like those guys are all at such a high level in each of their respective areas, you know? But I was like, man, that's cool. That like, it got me motivated to like work harder and think more critically and to like put more effort into what I'm doing and to be more intentional. And, uh, well, that's awesome. You know, it's like, like I've got the utmost respect and admiration for, for you and all those guys. But it like, it made me like be like, oh man, I don't want to be like, the biggest chump out of this this thing, I was like, I wanna, you know, made me want to step up my game to be even like considered for a project like this, you know. Well, that's cool. And but honest... go, go, going into it though, you never know what what right. you know what someone's vision is, but like as it's described versus like what the end result will be. And it's like, like I said, 
beyond my expectations. I'm like super stoked on all of it. Well, th- thanks, thanks. And that's kind of one something that I've realized. And I mean, I feel like, especially after what you just said, I feel like it's almost like we formed a support group, but not just between the five of us, but I think it's going to serve kind of as that for other people who are trying to do their own thing. It's like, sometimes it's just good to know that you're not the only well, one yeah, out there like, doing like I, having I, problems or like struggling. Well, yeah, I think to... like one of the things I've always noted was like, there's never been a handbook for anything that I've wanted to do. And like a lot of the time, even like, even though they're like along the same lines, there's not a lot of people that like have like similar experiences. So it was like real comforting to like see other scenarios where people have to like navigate through problems and challenges and whatnot, but then to be like, see, like see them succeed and like move forward and like, you know, not be completely discouraged by, you know, how difficult it can be to do things outside the normal structure. So it like, if just seeing, you know, the other guys, you know, exist, you know, within like all that discord of like, you know, the difficulty in doing things on your own, this project hopefully will, will create an even bigger understanding and like, you know, tipping point for, for other people that are doing cool stuff that like, you know, maybe they just have, it just hasn't clicked entirely for them and like, or they've been discouraged or what have you. And like, you know, they get to hear some of these, these thoughts and like scenarios and like see some of the cool results and be like, Oh, okay. Yeah. I got this. I could do it. Right. You know, like it just, it's just real cool to like, to share encouraging, you know, ideas and, you know, motivated, you know, people just not being beaten down by how easy it is to give up and like celebrating, you know, the hard way of doing things and like reaping those rewards, you know, whether yeah. they be tangible or not. Yeah, no, exactly. And even the failures, you know, it's, it's, I don't know. That's... Yeah. I'm like, and there's all those cliche, you know, sayings, you know, like failures are just like lessons, blah, blah, blah. But really it's like, it's hard to not get discouraged, but like, if, even if it's not like in the same physical community, like being in the same company as, as these people, like, there's that other old saying like steel sharpened steel. So it's like, Hmm. you know, taking, taking away from like what these guys have been through and, you know, how they have gotten through tough times. Like it just made me that much more aware and like, you know, zeroed in on like what I need to do and what I can do. And like, you know, what's possible. It's like, you know, those dudes have all done like, you know, really amazing stuff, you know, like seeing Sonny, like, archiving all that crazy stuff and like you know building his own infrastructure for doing it and like you know greg and chris and all that they've done it's like yeah it's like things that i i would have never like you know I, I i wouldn't have been able to relate to or consider with my experiences but seeing them do that it's like oh okay like that's a whole different approach to like problem solving and like you know i learned from that as well as like my own failures and like the difficulties that i've put myself through so it's just it's all it's all positive and it's all, you know, it's just, it's just good stuff, you know? Yeah, no, definitely. So hopefully this doesn't, this doesn't bring it down on stuff, but I do got to ask about, so the, the last year has obviously had a lot of challenges for everyone trying to do their own thing, you know, businesses in general. Mm-hmm. Is it affected how you done things or like i mean you starting a brand in the middle of this and a and a, and a nonprofit. So, like how how has that been it's a it's a it's a double-edged sword i guess you know like so we closed down fbm in january and then the pandemic happened mm. and then most of my pay jobs were 1099 working for vans and their events so obviously all the events this year have been canceled so i lost all my income you know, basically lost, you know, my lifelong project with FBM. Um, one of my parents passed away yeah. and I've moved full time into the bus. Like i had been living in the bus, but it was behind a house, but you know, I had to renovate the bus and reloc- relocate that. And then, you know, amidst all that, you know, we started Radshare 
prior, but we were trying to launch drop in and had to keep delaying it because, you know, the pandemic happened and then, you know, all the unrest with the, the George Floyd scenario happened and it just didn't seem like the, the right time to try to like, right. Start a new project, just kind of like, you know, bad omen style. Yeah. But then at the same time, like everything in every tough situation that I've had, I've had to deal with for the last, you know, 25 plus years kind of prepared me for this, you know, change in climate to be able to like, be fine with it, you know, like it sucks, you know, like, but like I'd always been broke. So being broke was just like, okay, it's just going to be broke for a while again. And, right, you know, it's like, so it's like, I mean, it sounds a little ridiculous, but well, the whole, the whole approach to, to doing FBM for all those years was so like, just whatever it takes to get things done that it just like the, the pandemic was just became like another inconvenient, like bummer scenario that you have to like work through. It wasn't like, Oh, my life's collapsing. I'm going to just fold up my, you know, fold the cards and like, you know, leave the game. It's just like, all right, well I got, here's another situation that's difficult that I got to figure out how to navigate within. So. Right. Well, it's kind of like, um, you know, it seems like sometimes when everything's falling apart around you, that's almost the best time to do something positive. Well, I think yeah. for me personally, it's like whenever things have gone well, it's when I've become the most complacent, and the most lazy, and I've had the most uninspired creativity. So like this year, it's kind of like for, you know, for a while I was like, like hyper productive with like doing paintings and I was able to sell paintings, you know, in order, you know, I was able to buy groceries with that money. So I was like, Oh, awesome. You know, like that hustle, you know, you know, lit a fire in me. And then like, once, you know, we decided that like, all right, we can't keep putting off the drop in idea every time there's like a, you know, a bummer news cycle. It's like, all right, cool. We'll just have to like figure out a way to make this work, you know, in changing times. So like having to hustle it, like, it's just, for me, it inspires creativity. Like, you know, whether it be create like artistic creativity or just like the creative hustle. So I think I thrive in tougher situations, not like financially, obviously, but like in, you know, being productive and, you know, problem solving and then just kind of like navigating tough situations, which, you know, for me, like there's, that's a lot more rewarding than just, you know, fluff. Just kind of coasting. Yeah. No, I hear you. I mean, I had a, similar struggle like internally with this project you know because i have i was afraid that it was just it was going to be tone deaf to try and just launch something like this in the in the middle of a a pandemic and all the but but that i think it's the actual opposite it's like sometimes during like tough scenarios people need something to, to hold on to something to hear like something to like motivate or inspire or just like even if it's just as simple as like get them off their asses you know and it's like something like this can can be uh, you know right and that's what i'm hoping i mean i had it i had finally great greg got on me he's like what are you doing and, and i told him he's like no it's like it's he told me pretty much what you just said it's the, it's the, the exact opposite people need something like this right now and i'm, yeah. I'm hoping that's the case and pe- people don't need to hear an advertisement for like something they need to buy or you know, whatever they need to hear that, like, Hey, life's not easy, but you know, it's you, you're capable of doing, you know, whatever you want. If you just like have the tenacity and the courage to, you know, put forth the effort and follow through on it. And, you know, I think, you know, Greg, Greg sets as as shining as an example as anybody on that, you know, like, yeah, he's the dude works as hard as anybody, you know, like, and as tough as anybody. And like, probably, never picked an easy route for doing anything that he's involved in but you know like yeah yeah you can't deny the dude's impact and influence yeah he he's that's undeniable scary sure. looking scary looking dude though <laughs> scary looking for <laughs> sure uh I'll be, so, able to, I'll be able to choke me out when he hears this <laughs> um along those lines uh 
I mean, you've definitely, even with FBM slowing down to where it's at, you're definitely keeping busy between the drop in and ride share and the paint painting. And are you doing work on any other books or anything? Like, I know you had that book with Matt Copeland. Um, yeah, me and Matt Copeland did a book like, uh, I guess it was like a year and a half ago. It was called bound for nowhere. And, uh, just short stories on travel and whatnot. And I've started outlining uh, a new book project that I don't want to get into yet. Okay. I haven't really figured out the entire direction of it, but I've got like, I've got like some framework for like a new book project. So cool. I'm working on that. And you know, our, and like this year is the first year I haven't traveled, right. you know, substantially. Usually I'm on the road for like at least half the year. So I've been lucky enough that, uh, you know, Richmond's a great city with a lot of cool stuff going on that, uh, I've been able to focus some of my energy and, and attention loc you know, locally, and, you know, my riding spots and, you know, where I live to just, uh, you know, try to make a little bit more zoomed in of a, an impact or, you know, an influence in positivity here in Richmond awesome. and like, the idea would be that, like, you know, because I spent so much time on the road and trying to do things, like, within the big picture of BMX with FBM, that now I can work more locally and kind of, like, send those ripple effects out from my own local community, not just, like, from the BMX community. Let's see. I don't want to keep you too long. We're coming up in an hour, and I'm trying to keep these less than an hour. But, any like, you kind of just went over it, but is there anything in particular that you're super stoked on at the moment that you want to push? Are you, are you doing a lot of painting? Um, um, everything kind of comes in cycles for me. So like I've been in and out of like, I, I, I can usually either write or paint, but I can't usually write and paint at the same time. Okay. So I've been putting down a lot of words on paper. So it's kind of, I'm, I'm transitioning in between words and paintings right now, but, gotcha. uh, I, you know, a lot of time just working on drop in and, you know, doing, like I was working on a, you know, a fundraiser with a skate shop in Ithaca, New York called homegrown for rad chair this morning. And, uh, just really excited about the idea once again, that anything is possible. You know, it's like, I call it born again, stoked. You know, like you do one thing for too long and you lose sight of like, you know, the, the fundamentals that make it so special. Cause you're just like, so zoomed in on everything. But now I'm like, you know, I'm at like a crossroads, so to speak. And I'm just like, I'm old and I'm beat up and I'm broke and I'm living in a school bus. And I'm like, I'm lucky enough to think still that like literally anything is possible and I can do whatever I want. And, you know, I'm excited to be able to, like, share the good parts of who I am and what I can do and, uh, you know, be in, like, unique, awesome situations like this phone call and this documentary and, you know, the communities that I'm a part of. And I'm just excited, you know, like, and it's hard to, like, maintain a positive outlook, but, like, you put yourself around the right people and, and you involve yourself in the right things. It's like, it'll, you know, it'll come to you, you know, like, even with all the, the tough, challenging you know, scenarios that come along with it all. That's awesome. That's such a good message. It's like perfect. Perfect. Um, how can people find you? You know, what, what do you want to, where do you want to direct people? Um, my Instagram is Crandall FBM. And, uh, that's where I do a lot of like my just day to day, like message sharing, but, um, Instagram for rad share is just at rad share. And then drop in coffee is at drop underscore in underscore coffee, drop in coffee. Um, both of them have websites, radshare.org, drop in coffee.com. And uh, some of my writing can be seen on a website called leastmost.com, which is totally independent of like any kind of like business ventures, just creative sharing. Cool. Anything else you want to add? Um, have fun every day. And, uh, Work hard and be nice to people. Awesome, man. Thanks so much for doing this, Steve. Thank you, dude. You guys all have a good one. Appreciate everything. All right. Hope you enjoyed that talk with Steve Crandall. If you get a chance, 
please leave us a rating and review in iTunes or Spotify or wherever you're listening to this. It really helps build awareness and it would mean a lot to me. Also, don't forget to check out the six-part Don't Stand in Line docuseries, which we were talking about. Uh, you can learn more about that and everything else we're working on at codecprojects.com. Uh, that's C-O-D-E-C. P R O J E C T S. You can also find us on Instagram and Facebook and YouTube at kodakprojects.com. Um, we're actually over at Facebook. We have a Facebook group going now for uh, anyone who's interested in entrepreneurship or just kind of doing their own thing. You might want to go check that out. It's a pretty cool resource. Um, and thanks again. See you next week. Don't sweat. Don't-